Australia is the sixth largest country in the world and the largest in the continent of Oceania, population of 25 million, which is mostly concentrated on the eastern seaboard. The country is formed of six states. Western Australia is the largest, with the state capital located on the southwestern part of the country, Perth. Founded by Captain Jane Stirling in 1829, Perth is the fourth largest city in the country, the city having a population of 2 million since the June 2017 census. There are many points of interest visitors may wish to come and visit, such as here, the Swan Bell Tower that contains 18 hanging bells placed inside a specifically built 82.5 metre high copper and glass campanile. The majority of the bells came from the Church of St Martin's in the Fields in London and have become the second largest chain ringing bells in the world after the Christ Church Cathedral in Dublin. The spiritual heart of the city is the Swan River, which drains into the Indian Ocean at Fremantle. Flowing for 72 kilometres or 45 miles from the Wurulu Brook, the river was first named back in 1697 by the Dutch explorer Wilhelm de Vlaming in reflection of the famous black swans that have colonised in this part of the country. Various European expeditions occurred within the start of the 18th century, right up until the British established the Swan River Colony in 1829, which was the very start of the building of the concrete jungle of Perth that you see today. The Central Area Transit System, or CAT as they are known, provide a zero-fare policy to take intending passengers or tourists to many different locations in the city. A popular tourist attraction which overlooks Perth is Kings Park that covers an area of 400 hectares of land with a mixture of grassland, botanic gardens and war memorials. The park provides various walks for tourists to visit certain areas and reflect on the history of the old routes, some laid way back into Aboriginal time. This is the State War Memorial, an iconic monument in the park positioned on Mount Eliza. Adjacent is the Flame of Remembrance and the Pool of Reflection. These, as well as the monument, remind us of the men and women of Western Australia who fought gallantly in the Boer, First and Second World, Korean and Vietnam Wars. Their names are inscripted beneath the cenotaph. The views from Kings Park are stunning with beautiful blue and clear skies all year round. Whilst much of the sunny weather can range to 28 to 33 degrees, in 1998 the humidity broke the record of reaching 50 and a half degrees, whilst the lowest ever temperature reached was minus 7.2 degrees in 2008. A small area of the park is occupied by the Botanic Gardens, with a set of 2,000 different species of floral plants here. John Oldham was the man who first designed the garden and was meant to have opened for the British Empire and Commonwealth Games of 1962, but instead opened three years later to the public on the 4th of October. Numerous statues have been erected here in the park of many warriors of war and monarchs, including Her Majesty Queen Victoria, the second longest reigning monarch of the British Empire. A familiar name, but Ye London Court is a hotspot for tourists with a distinctive Tudor and Elizabethan facade with ornate entrances and wrought iron gates. It was opened on the 29th of July 1937 by the former Lieutenant Governor and Premier Sir James Mitchell, describing the myriad of arcades as unique to Australia and an ornament to the city. Old and new stand side by side.
Of course, the country is well known for its kangaroos, but these statues are situated just outside the Stirling Gardens. There are many more significant sculptural items within the park, though many people come here to relax in and throughout the day to enjoy the peace and tranquility. St George's Cathedral is an Anglican church dating from 1879 to 1888, built from locally made bricks, limestones and jara. A tile roof was added in the 1950s to replace the original slate as the cathedral had leaked many times from rainwater. Rose windows dominate at each end, and there's this elegantly installed organ from 1993, complementing the architecture of both the navel and chancel. The other main cathedral is St Mary's and can be described as unique as parts of it date from the 19th and others from the 21st century. The first part was completed in 1865 and by the 1920s plans had been drawn up to have a perpendicular Gothic Ephesus. However, these plans were put on hold because of the Great Depression. For over 70 years the cathedral stood incomplete right up until 1999 after two million dollars were raised to complete the remaining section of the cathedral. Many more delays ensued over the years with erosion of the oldest section but the expansion work was finally completed in 2009 at a cost of 32.9 million dollars. Located in the northeastern suburbs is Midland Station, with its typical 1960s station entrance. There are three platforms, with Platform 1 being designated for the standard gauge long distance services to Kalgoorlie, Adelaide and Sydney. The two bay platforms are for local Transperth services, and our train sits in Platform 2, ready for departure to Fremantle on board a Transperth A-Series electric multiple unit. Here we join the standard gauge tracks of the long distance railway services. From Midland to East Perth, mixed gauge is implemented. Standard Australian track gauge is measured at 4 feet 8.5 inches, similar to that in the UK and other parts of Europe. Transperth EMUs run on a smaller track gauge of 3 feet 6 inches. The original Midland Junction station was sited 300 metres to the west, opening in 1886. In turn, it was replaced of that of today's station in 1968. All trains on the Transperth network are now driver-only operated. Woodbridge Station was opened in 1903 as West Midland until it was renamed in 1971.
Just to our left is the third side of the triangular junction, which rarely sees much use apart from the odd freight train. Many passenger trains used this line to reach the southern part of the country, but was eventually withdrawn between 1949 and 1967. The Eastern Railway Company built the very first suburban line in Perth and was extended over time to run out into rural Australia to many secluded towns. This section of line was opened from Guildford to Chidlow's Well in March 1884, from which gradual extension to other points of the compass, such as Northam and Bellevue, right up until 1893. Conversely, East Guildford was called Woodbridge from 1896 to 1908. Look very carefully on your left and you can see one of the old carriages carefully preserved here alongside the railway. We've now reached the first stage of the Eastern Railway here at Guildford, opened all the way from Fremantle on the 1st of March 1881. The first sod of the railway was turned by Governor Ord here on the 3rd of June 1879 and was jointly celebrated with the 50th anniversary of the settlement of Western Australia. In fact, as we've heard, the Swan River Colony was actually first established here in Guildford in 1829 the stations are largely unaltered from opening since 1881. We now cross the River Swan adjacent to the Guildford Road Bridge. These bridges are open structures with no protection on either side, but some have discrete guide rails laid so the train does not make an indemnifying departure. This is Success Hill. This station opened in 1960 to serve the nearby Bassendine Oval Stadium. Steam was first employed over the line with the line's opening though between 1951 to 1972, WAGRW class locomotives were in operation from Perth to Bunbury. The locos were regularly stored at the Midland workshops to undergo major overhauls or cleaning purposes. By 1968, most of the routes within the Perth area had become dieselised, but steam power continued on until they were condemned from service in 1972. The workshops at Midland closed in 1980. 
Bassendine opened in 1910 as West Guildford until it was renamed 12 years later. The original station buildings on the platform were demolished as part of the upgrade works which began in 2003 for one year totalling at a cost of $5 million. The improvement works included the provision of lifts to aid the disabled and those with heavy luggage, etc. Ashfield Station opened in 1954. On the left, construction work has begun for the 8km or 5 mile long branch line to the airport and forest field with an intermediate stop at Redcliffe. The trains will run underground in twin bore tunnels beneath the Swan River and airport complex before they emerge at the terminus. The line is scheduled to open in 2021, venturing at an even more expensive cost of $1.8 billion. For the second time in history, Bayswater will be the junction of the brand new line to Forest Field. A year after the station opened in 1896, the Eastern Railway built a branch to Belmont on the other side of the River Swan to terminate near the Ascot Racecourse. The line's future looked bleak in 1926 following torrential flooding instigated by the heavy rain causing all train services to be suspended. The death knell came in 1956 when the bridge over the Swan caught fire resulting in the line's closure and the following year the track and stations were removed.
As part of the TransPerth network, all station facilities provide step-free access from the platforms to street level. These include the instalment of footbridges with slopes at either end of the platforms or footpath crossings allowing passengers to cross the line. Here at Maylands, the classic station building still survives alongside today's island platform, with the canopy being incorporated to match the original. First opened in 1896 as Mars Sidings for one year before being renamed Full Kirk until 1899 for when the present name came into existence. The Transperth system is regarded as a commuter rail system, despite it sharing similarities with other rapid transits. These include the high frequency service on certain lines, shorter distances between stations, and trains with faster acceleration and sharper braking. While on the Midland Fremantle line has a service frequency of four trains an hour, the Mandurah and Joondalup lines are every five minutes, making it the most frequent rail system in Australia. In total, the Transperth network carries around 64 million passengers a year, while this line alone carries 10 million passengers annually. Most stations on the Eastern Railway were added onto the railway map over the intervening years as a demand in increase of suburbia. Mount Lawley was no exception and was opened in 1907 with platforms facing each other before the station was rebuilt in 1968. This iron bridge takes us over the Guildford Road, Route 5. The standard gauge tracks now leave us to run into their own platform at the East Perth Terminal, which will come into view on the right. Just briefly, we can see one of the diesel units, known as the Prospector, sitting in the Long Bay platform ready to depart for Kalgoorlie, 595 kilometers away, east from Perth. The former locomotive shed and carriage sidings have now been built upon by today's station and by the large tower block, the headquarters of TransPerth. The 650 metre long platform is also used by the sleeper train that runs to even further locations such as Sydney and Melbourne. Trans WA also provide a coach service to other Australian destinations. As you watch the bus, what is that on the right of the picture? A preserved WAGN W-Class 482 locomotive Bakewell 
has been tastefully preserved within the former workshop yard. The loco is maintained by the Australian Railway Historical Society who are located at the Rail Transport Museum in Bassendean. Between East Perth and Claysbrook, the line passes beneath the Graham Farmer Freeway. Rising up and out of the tunnel, we come alongside the line from Armadale and Thornley, coloured yellow on the network map. The line had opened to Armadale in 1889, although the spur off the line to Thornley opened in 2005, being to the latest station on the network. Today there's an interval service along the line with Armadale trains running express through certain stations as far as Cannington, where the Thornley Junction is located. This was the original East Perth station of 1883, but with the opening of today's station in 1969, this station was renamed Claysbrook. The Armadale Thorny line runs alongside as far as Perth. The tracks joining on the far left come from Claysbrook Depot, the main servicing facility of the A series trains. The B series trains are also stabled here and maintenance carried out when work cannot be done at their respective depots at Mandurah and Nawagup. Most recently, the depot also oversees the maintenance of the Trans WA Australind DMUs. This is MacIver. The aforementioned Trans WA Australind train passes on Platform 2 with a service to Bunbury, already starting its two and a half hour journey. We get the route indicator into Platform 7 at Perth Station.
The biggest station on the Trans-Perth network, Perth Station has six through platforms and three bays, the latter for terminating Armadale Thorny trains as well as the Trans-WA service. The neoclassic style station building facing Wellington Street has been considerably enlarged between 1880 and 1894, becoming the headquarters of the Western Australian Government Railways until 1976. Platforms 1 and 2 are located at a lower level, named Perth Underground. Services are run by B-series trains, with routes to Mandurah in the south and Butler in the north. The network map would now deem this the end of the Midland Line, and so we change from the purple to the blue of the Fremantle Line. On departure, we enter the long tunnel where a major property development has been rafted above the line. Here we can see the connection with the Joondalup line, allowing trains to gain access to the depot. Until 1987, this station was known as West Perth. This line was closed by the government in September 1979, following three one-day counts in passenger traffic in the summers of 1971, 75 and 77. Outrage was felt from all of the locals who had vociferously campaigned for the line to remain open, even as go as far to get a petition signed by 110,000 people. Fortuitously for the locals, there was a change of government and services were reinstated on the 29th of July 1983. West Leaderville is not far away from the other Leaderville station that is served by trains of the Joondalup line.
A third platform was installed here in 2007 to handle the extra crowds bound for the nearby Subiaco Oval. This underground station at Subiaco opened on the 12th of December 1998 as a result of the Subi Centro project which resulted in 900 metres of rails being sunk underground. The original station was opened two years after the line itself and consisted of an elevated signal cabin which has survived and is now preserved by the Bennett Brook Railway. Notice the extremely large extraction fans on the tunnel roof, an excellent way of removing the pollution from the tunnels. We're now arriving at Daglish. The station opened in 1924, named after the first Australian Labour Party state premier of WA, Henry Daglish. The reversing siding is mainly used during the special crowd events at Subiaco Oval. West Subiaco opened in 1908. By 1934, it was renamed to Shenton Park.
This is Karakata. It was opened in 1886 and is opposite the large cemetery. The distance between Karakata and Loch Street is the shortest on the line, being 500 metres apart. Loch Street had the shortest platforms on the network, not being able to accommodate the four car trains which now run in everyday use. In 2009 work was completed to extend the platforms. The junction provides access to the bay platform at Showground Station, the only one on our route today that we shall run through non-stop. Trains call at this station if there is an event going on at the nearby Claremont Showgrounds, such as the Perth Royal Show. Talking of expresses, many trains in peak hours omit calling at certain stations. These are normally indicated at all of the stations, showing certain service patterns so, as an example, the stopping pattern B from Perth will call at all stations to Claremont and then run non-stop to Fremantle. Opened with the line in 1881, the station buildings here at Claremont are the oldest extant railway buildings in Perth. The building was designed in 1886 by George Temple Poole, who is renowned for his architectural work in Western Australia. With the traditional elevated all-lever signal cabin, old semaphore signals, an old wooden footbridge, this is a time warp if ever there was one. The station once had five platforms during its heyday in the 1900 era, but gradual rationalisation has seen this whittled down to two, especially in 1991 at the time of electrification. Replacing the current diesel to electric transition had proven to be a costly one and started in 1984. The first line to be electrified was the Armadale line in October 1991, with this line to Fremantle and Midland occurring two months later in December. The A-series trains had arrived one month early. They were built by Walker Limited in Maryborough for Transperth between 1991 and 1999 with 43 two-car units, 43 metres long and 2.9 metres wide. During the day, the two-car trains are doubled up to make four cars now that passenger traffic has dramatically increased within the years of the 21st century. The B-series trains entered service in 2004 as part of the new Metrorail project to operate over the new Joondalup and Mandurah lines. While many upgrade works had to be employed by upgrading the network to the tracks and stations, it's destined to change even further with the replacement of the A-series trains to C-series EMUs, hopefully arriving in time for the Forest Field line opening. 
back to costing, it's estimated that all of this work totaled up to a staggering figure of $109 million, which is equivalent to £60 million. The line now swings further south and draws alongside the Highway Route 71, Curtin Avenue. The pylons aren't made of steel, but of reinforced concrete and support the electrification wires, which is nominally rated at 25 kilovolts AC. The signalling is uniform to both standard and narrow gauge systems, all signals displaying three aspect colour lights. In similar contrast to standard British signalling, this single yellow aspect pre-warns the driver that the next signal will be red and must take precautions if it is. Incidentally, the signalling is due to be thoroughly updated within the next couple of years to replace the current ageing system to be placed with a high-tech automatic digital version. The new state-of-the-art technology will allow trains to run automatically and enable the provision of a more regular service, especially during the peak periods. There is clear evidence of the former southbound platform, which now lies dormant. Having opened in 1884 as Bullen Siding, the station was a request stop for intending passengers arriving at the Albion Hotel. Passengers could halt the incoming trains by means of a red flag during the day and candle in a jar at night. It was renamed Cottesloe in 1892, for which trains began to stop here seven days a week. The interiors of the A-series trains have two inward-facing rows running the full length of the train and can allow 72 passengers to sit, with 82 having to stand. The two-car trains are able to handle a total capacity of 308 people and has one or two wheelchair sections in every coach. Also on board, announcements have been pre-recorded to aid the blind while similarly, a dot matrix LED system has been added on board to help the deaf. The driver uses the horn to warn intending road users and walkers that we are approaching the level crossing. Majority of all crossings are half barriered and are lowered when trains depress the treadles situated in the three foot of the running line.
Mosman Park has been known as Buckland Hill and Cottesloe Beach during its time here since 1894, but has kept its identity since 1937. Drivers of Transperth trains have marker boards denoting where they should stop, allowing the passengers to alight and not have to walk so far to the exits. From Victoria Street, the line now runs alongside the beach and we get our first view of the Indian Ocean. This was the site of Leighton Station that had opened in 1922 but closed in 1991 following the electrification of the line and the re-siting of North Fremantle Station. The barren waste ground alongside the old station was where a complex amount of rail tracks were laid for the Leighton Marshalling Yard. Various freight trains would enter the network containing small fuel wagons loaded with petrol and diesel, whereas others would arrive carrying hundreds of manufactured cars. Now the yard is virtually redundant as the nearby North Wharf has superseded the freight traffic which is more efficient in container handling and importing motor vehicles by boat. The very original 1881 North Fremantle station was located just here before the junction with the standard gauge freight line from Fremantle Harbour. In 1964 a new halt was built a little further south so that the site of the station could be redeveloped as a diesel power depot.
To reach Fremantle, we cross over the Swan River for the second time, built alongside the Fremantle Traffic Bridge. The first bridge was replaced as it was located at the eastern edge of the harbour and was relocated to its current position in 1964. In 1926, the old bridge was badly damaged by flooding, but hastily rebuilt soon afterwards. The sign on the left reads 75, meaning kilometres per hour. The top speed on the line is 100 kph, or 67 miles per hour. The line now becomes single as we approach the terminal platform at Fremantle. Although it's a through road, trains are unable to continue beyond as one of the rails has been interlaced and the wires ceased just beyond the platform. The continuation of tracks was part of the southern extension to Robs Jetty on the 22nd of October 1898 and by 1903 to Coogee. These days, Freight only continues southwards. A large bus station stands outside the main station building, designed by William Dartnell, is little altered from its opening in 1881. There was one exception to passenger traffic heading south from here for one year from 1986 with the staging of the America's Cup of 1987. Fremantle is a port city and is located alongside the mouth of the Swan River. Part of the Swan River colony was actually based here in Fremantle in 1829 and a hundred years later was declared a city with a population of 29,000. The first building to be built in the town was the Roundhouse, built in 1830 and was used for the colonial and indigenous prisoners right up until 1886. All prisoners were then transferred to the main Fremantle prison. A cannon is situated in front and in collaboration with the time ball is dropped at around 1pm. At the same time the cannon is fired too. Fremantle has one of the largest and busiest cargo ports in Western Australia, with a large volume of shipping containers carrying various imports arriving and departing here 24 hours a day. 
the port dates from the beginning of the Swan River colony. However, many vessels found it very difficult to enter due to a rocky bar blocking the estuary. The very first Navy vessel to enter the port was the HMS Driver on the 4th of December 1845, who sailed from Portsmouth Dockyard and is credited to be the first Royal Navy ship to circumnavigate the globe. Further history details of the dock's past, present and future can be found in the Maritime Museum, perched right on the edge of the ocean coastline. Inside, there's a range of exhibits with numerous galleries symbolising Western Australia's maritime history. Visitors get to discover about the many leisure and handcraft sailing boats that have once sailed across the ocean, which some are suspended from the ceiling and others placed in a much larger hall to get the full view. The museum is open seven days a week from 9.30am to 5pm, although on Anzac Day open from 1 to 5pm and closed on certain celebrated holidays. We are now destined on a 30 minute journey to Rottnest Island, 20 kilometres out from the mainland of Australia, with the Rottnest Express running at an hourly frequency. The island was colonised just one year after the colony in Fremantle and has been a popular destination with tourists over the years. The island covers an area of 19 square miles containing some beautiful scenery in this remote gem. Here we can see the Rotnest tram arriving at the short station here called Settlements to run to Oliver Hill where intending passengers can see some of the most beautiful scenery on the south side of the island. The tramway runs next to the island's airport which is a small private airport for light aircraft. It was opened in 1930 and has been mainly used since for private aviation and small commercial operations. The island restricts all motor vehicles apart from buses, so the only way you will get around the island is by bicycle, which you can hire from the pedal and flipper hire station. Without the bikes, tourists wouldn't be able to see the spectacular beaches or see the quakas, which are small mammals related to the kangaroos and wallabies and can only be found on the small islands in Western Australia. Mm -hmm. 
Cycle all the way to the end of the island and you arrive at Cape Vlamin, where beyond is nothing but ocean, with the nearest mainland being 3,000 kilometers away. Next to Fishhook Bay, a small footpath was established by the Rotness Foundation, opened this broad walk in 2012 at a cost of $300,000. This replaced the old wooden walkway and this low maintenance and environmentally friendly construction allows visitors to get some spectacular views of the ocean in the off chance of taking pictures of the vast quantities of wildlife as well as seeing the mainland from a distance. Perth, a delight to visit. From 1345 by Bishop Trevor, who lived at his manor house, Trevor Hall. Enlarging the town may have done the trick, as the town is popular all year round. We continue westwards with the rich waters of the Avon Keiru alongside that now follow us for the next seven miles just before Keligadridion. typical of the A5, the road straightens out and we can see distant views ahead. In a matter of fact, as you possibly might have noticed, that most of the road runs on a straight alignment. This feature is all Wales, Cardiff, Bangor and Swansea. The Eisteddfodd is normally run at the first week of August and can be in a variety of different locations so that the Welsh language can be widely spoken. There are dozens of tents, booths and pavilions that are constructed in the open field which means it is easy for people to explore the different range of shops and small businesses all eager to promote themselves even earning a small fortune. Opposite the food store is the large stage where many performers show off their talent of singing, dancing, poetry, etc. A 
approaching Journey's End, the road passes the viewpoint at Kregiai Nimrod. Entering suburbia, the national speed limit signs disappear altogether and the normal speed limit of 30 miles per hour is attained. District, one of many national parks to have been amalgamated in 1951. Sixteen lakes in total form the Lake District, the largest being Lake Windermere at Bowness on Windermere. The small coastal town back in the day only had a few sets of houses and farms to its name. Nevertheless, it wasn't until 1855 that iron ore was discovered from the nearby Hod Barrow Quarry. The statue in the town centre commemorates the ironworks that occurred here at the time, with the nearby Millen Museum recollecting relics from the past. Carlisle. The 30 miles per hour speed limit now applies and we continue into the city centre. Urbanisation has now begun. At 1835, at the time of the golden era of coaching, coaches could reach York from London in 20 hours and along here to Edinburgh in 45 and a half hours. The East Coast Main Line, even today, is the main competition of the road for the entire length. Unfair competition like this saw the reduction of stagecoaches along the GNR in the mid 19th century. The start of the single track road to Holy Island. The Lindisfarne Causeway from the mainland is notorious, requiring road travellers to check the road ahead before crossing. Until the tide has cleared away, motorists may park by the side of the road or in the car park in order to avoid their cars or lorries being stuck in the water. Allocated timetables are given out at each end of the causeway in free car parks from the county council. Nonetheless, despite this, about one vehicle is marooned in the middle of the sea each month, requiring the HM Coast Guard to come and provide a rescue. The railway route to Tweedbank. Just beyond the bridge is New Craig Hall Junction, situated near one of Edinburgh's busy park and rides. The road is now built up on both sides to where we terminate.